Thank you so very much to Think, to Christians for Israel. It's an absolute privilege to be here, to see old faces and new faces, and to talk about the borders of the State of Israel. What are the legal principles that determine those borders. We have had a crash course in the international law applying before the founding of the State of Israel. We've also had uh, a run through the historical developments up until this, this Declaration of Independence, and all of that is incredibly important background for when we come to the creation of the only Jewish state in 1948. And if there's one thing that uh, I hope that you all take away from this conference, it is the international law governing the formation of states and the formation of their borders at the critical date, which is often referred to as the de Declaration of Independence, the establishment of states under international law. And I know I'm biased because it's my session, but this truly is a rule of customary international law which underpins almost every misapplication of international law that you will find with respect to Israel, every allegation and every abuse of international law against the only Jewish state. And it's critical that we understand this principle, know how to apply it, and understand the equal application of international law in this context. It's an area in which politics and law frequently overlap and in which there has become a language, specific language of condemnation with respect to Israel, in which terms like illegal occupation um, and uh, illegal settlements, which you'll hear more about later on, uh, are inextricably linked with discussions of Israel and the legal status of the territory. And it's unfortunate that politics has infected this, uh, the, the application of international law in Israel's case. Before I get into the legal rules here, I think it's important to caveat this with a provision that nothing about the law or its application should prejudice any political agreement or diplomatic agreement that Israel and its neighbors can enter into. Uh, that is a question of politics. And what we're crucially aiming for at this conference is to get the law right so that we understand the legal basis that we're operating from when looking at the possible political solutions that can be reached. And so the first key issue I want uh, to talk about with you is the rule of customary international law, Uti Procedetis Juris. We've had a little bit of information about international law so far, but I think it's important to highlight two key sources of international law for you, and they are treaty law and custom. International treaty law is, states that, uh, is law that states bind themselves to by signing themselves up. Uh, it's like a contract, if you will, uh, for those lawyers in the room that are familiar with the domestic context. International custom is a very strange beast, and it develops in international law um, a body of rules of custom that reflect state practice, but they require states to behave in a particular way, believing themselves to be bound to behave in that way, for custom to bite, and for a rule of customary international law to develop, which then binds those states going forward. It's unique. But it's important to understand because of this critical rule of customary international law that I'll come on to, uti possidetis juris. Just before I do that, I want to talk about a big misconception in international law, and you'll frequently hear this being uh, touted with respect to Israel, uh, and that is the legal status of UN resolutions. People will often come to you and say the UN uh, has ruled, or the UN says this, and, and that is, uh, of course, law. And it's important to be able to push back on this because the vast majority of UN resolutions have no legal status. They are purely political instruments. The status of a UN resolution depends on whether it's made in the General Assembly or the Security Council. General Assembly resolutions are not binding ever. They are political statements. And in the Security Council, resolutions are only binding if they are made under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Now, resolutions made under Chapter 7 are incredibly rare. They are the strongest legal tool in the UN legislative box because they have legal teeth. And because of that, they're also very rarely made. It's much easier to pass political statements that don't bite. There is some debate about certain resolutions passed in the Chapter 6, 
that use particular language, like decides. But again, I'm, I'm going to leave that aside because it's not relevant for the purposes of most of the discussions that we're going to be having today. So that's critical, uh, that ve very, very rarely do we have legally binding UN Security Council resolutions. And it's particularly important in the context of resolution of the General Assembly 181, which we talked about earlier today, the partition resolution, which was a recommendation, not a decision, a recommendation of the General Assembly that was never implemented. And because it was never implemented, and because it has uh, General Assembly status, of course, it's not binding. When we come to look at the status of the territory, the customary international law that applies when all states are formed applies to Israel also at its Declaration of Independence in 1948. And this is the rule of uti possidetis juris, universally applied. It developed in the 19th century in uh, South America. It was applied in Asia and Africa. It was applied in the dissolution of the former Soviet uh, Federation. Uh, to all states that emerged in all of these contexts, including to states that emerged from mandates, this is the rule that international law developed to provide certainty, to provide clean lines, so that all parties concerned knew where the borders would lie, and as the, Burkino, uh, as the International Court of Justice in the Burkina Faso Mali case in 1986 stated clearly when it talked about the emergence of this rule, the important thing was to preserve peace and stability and provide that certainty and to avoid fratricidal struggles. Um, it's important, as I mentioned, to note that the rule also applied to states emerging from mandates, the mandate for Mesopotamia when it became the Kingdom of Iraq, the mandates for Syria, Lebanon. Uh, in all cases, the default rule for states emerging uh, from these administrative units, and we heard specifically about the mandate in Palestine uh, of 1920, in all these cases, this rule was applied. And it states that newly emerging states take on the pre-existing boundaries of the unit that preceded them, that came before them. That is uti possidetis juris. It's the default rule. So it applies wherever there isn't an agreement to the contrary. It doesn't prevent an agreement to the contrary being reached. But it provides that fallback. Um, another fundamental rule of international law is its equal application. You cannot have a general rule and an exception for a country you don't like very much or you have some ideological or political opposition to. No respectable legal system can operate like that. So the question has to be, what does this rule, universally applied, tell us about the legal status of the territory in Israel's case? And the key question that we've been asked, what are the borders? Well, before the creation of the State of Israel, it's a slide we've seen many times already this morning. We had the uh, mandate. Uh, and I'm sure by now you're all very familiar with the borders of that mandate, the administrative lines. Um, and of course, when the British divided the separate unit of Transjordan, which later became the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, uh, by the way, Jordan's formation also followed the rules of uti possidetis juris, what we have uh, is a new administrative line that runs down the eastern side of the mandate, all the way down the Jordan River and to the Red, uh, the Red Sea. That is the critical line as far as the establishment of the status of the West Bank in later years uh, is, is going to be. Israel is the only state to emerge from that darker, shaded territory from the British Mandate under this international rule of custom, uh, inherits, if you will, the administrative lines, takes on those administrative lines as its internationally recognized borders in accordance with all the other examples uh, that we've cited. Um, and that includes East Jerusalem and the West Bank, as you can see on the darker shaded territory, which was occupied by Jordan, as you've heard, between 1948 and 1967, uh, in Israel's independence war. That same area, East Jerusalem and the West Bank, was then recovered by Israel 
1967. There is one example, which we are now all painfully aware of, uh, given Russia's war on Ukraine, which bears a direct and important parallel to the situation that occurred in 1967. Because today, as we see U uh, Ukraine uh, fighting back and defending its territory, uh, it is no longer impossible to imagine that it might recover Crimea from Russia. Now, the reason that the international community accepts that Crimea is part of Ukraine's territory is because of Uti Posidetis Juris, because those were the lines that became Ukraine's borders at the formation of the state. If Ukraine were to recover Crimea in the same way that Israel recovered uh, East Jerusalem, as it became known, and the West Bank, uh, as it became known, Judea and Samaria, if it recovered those uh, disputed territories, uh, from Jordan in the same way uh, as in the hypothetical situation of Ukraine. Uh, on one hand, it is accused of being the occupier, and on the other, of course, no one would dare to accuse Ukraine of occupying Crimea from Russia uh, in these circumstances. And that is a stark uh, parallel that one can draw. It highlights uh, the incredible misapplication, abuse of international law with respect to the State of Israel, and it's something that should be robustly put uh, push back against. Now, um, I mentioned that it's the default rule, so if there had been an agreement to the contrary, and later on I'm sure there'll be further discussion of the impact that the Oslo Accords had on the questions that we're considering, but if there had been an agreement to the contrary in 1948, 1949, that would uh, supersede the application of this rule of customary international law, or T. Posidetis Juris. But there are agreements that reinforce the application of this rule. Um, to the uh, establishment of the borders of the State of Israel at the critical date, its Declaration of Independence in 1948. And those first are the armistice agreements, uh, which uh, refer back to the 1920 mandate. The context, of course, as you were hearing just before this session, uh, is that seven Arab states and some uh, Palestinian Arabs sought to destroy the fledgling Jewish state um, by force, immediately upon the Declaration of Independence, and the new state beat back those armies, except in the area of Judea and Samaria, um, and in the old city of Jeru Jerusalem, in which um, individuals who lived there were, were overrun, uh, were killed or expelled. And the hostilities were terminated by these armistice agreements in 1949 which delineated the lines beyond which the armed forces of the respective parties shall not move. These became known as the Green Lines. I just want to read you two extracts as I bring these remarks to a close um, from those peace agreements. Because, uh, so forgive me, from, from the peace agreements that followed, the only peace agreements that have been instituted, uh, because the key thing to remember about the armistice agreements is that they were in no way meant to... Uh, form borders, and the parties were very clear about that, not least because those entities that were signing armistice agreements with Israel refused to accept the existence of the state at that point, as that's important to remember. But the peace agreements that Israel has been able to come to with its neighbors are also very informative on this point. And the peace between Israel and the Republic of Egypt in 1979 at Article uh, 1, reads, the permanent boundary between Egypt and Israel is the recognized international boundary between Egypt and the former mandatory territory of Palestine. Interesting, that one. Uh, the other treaty that's worth citing is, of course, the one from 1994 with the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, Article 3. The international boundary between Israel and Jordan is delimited with reference to the boundary definition under the mandate as shown in Annex 1A and the mapping uh, materials that were attached. So the legal status at Israel's independence is crucial and it tells us not only that Israel's presence in the territory is lawful but also crucially that it cannot be a situation of occupation. And I appreciate that you will cover this in some more detail later, but I'll just set out in brief form the framework of the law of occupation, uh, developed in public international law, actually not in the first instance to protect uh, individuals living in a territory, but to protect the rights of the former sovereign 
in that territory uh, for a period in which they had been ousted until there was a peace agreement that would settle the status and either that sovereign would return or there would be a uh, normalization of uh, the territory as, as under a new administration and jurisdiction. So even if one were to quibble with the application of Utipositatis Juris, um, as we've heard just before lunch, it's uh, very, very difficult to manufacture an argument under international law to justify there being any other sovereign in that territory. Um, and that being the case, the occupation framework in which we apply the Geneva Conventions that are going to be crucial to the later discussion on the legality of settlements, because all of the arguments against settlements in law are predicated on the application of Article 49.6 of Geneva Convention 4. The framework in which all of those rules are applied simply doesn't work where there is no sovereign that has been ousted from their territory, let alone when one applies the principle of utipositatis juris, the rule of utipositatis juris, and recognises the underlying sovereign claim uh, of Israel to the territory. Um, it's worth just mentioning briefly that, of course, Israel's approach to the West Bank uh, in 1967, when it recovered that territory, was very different to its approach to Jerusalem. What did Israel do with respect to its legal rights in Jerusalem? Well, of course, the Declaration of Independence doesn't contain any reference to borders. Uh, the reference is made to Eretz Israel, uh, and the question of borders is, by default, uh, a provision of customary international law. But in 1949, in December, the Knesset decided that Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel. And on the 26th of December, 1949, the Knesset held its first session in West Jerusalem. In 1950, in January, again, the Israeli parliament uh, declared Jerusalem to be the capital of the state. And crucially, when Israeli forces ousted Jordanian forces from East Jerusalem and recovered the West Bank in, in the Six-Day War, which ended on the 10th of June, 1967, Israel immediately took steps to extend its law, administration, and jurisdiction over the whole of Jerusalem using the terminology, areas formerly part of mandatory Palestine. And that, that key terminology, which is reflected in the peace agreements, of course, is, is also cited here. Uh, in that same month, uh, then Minister of Foreign Affairs, Abba Eben, uh, wrote to the Secretary General of the United Nations, informing him that, of course, this not, did not constitute annexation. And that term is frequently used with respect to Israel and its past activities or its proposed activities. You cannot annex your own sovereign territory. So what Israel did with Jerusalem was, of course, very different to its approach uh, to the West Bank, where it instituted a temporary administration in the anticipation that a peace agreement with Jordan, in the usual form, which history and international law tells us uh, is, is what parties generally do after a conflict ends, um, it kept that land in a temporary state with a temporary administration to facilitate that future peace agreement. And in, 1940, uh, in 1994, when Israel signed that peace agreement with Jordan, it unfortunately did not resolve that underlying issue. One thing that it's important to recall is that no situation of occupation, as far as I'm aware, I'm happy to be corrected, if I know there are many prominent international lawyers in the room, but no situation of occupation that I have ever come across outlives a peace agreement. And this much, I believe, was recognized even in the Hansel Memorandum, which, of course, was uh, famously reversed with respect to the legality of, of settlements, or at least um, amended uh, by Secretary of State Pompeo under the last administration. If there are two rules, if there are two issues um, coming back to the initial title, um, or the subtitle, which are what are the principles uh, that help us determine the borders of the State of Israel, uh, I want you to remember uti possidetis juris and the equal application of the law. That's all that we're asking for with respect to the State of Israel. That gives us the answer on borders. The rest is for the politicians and the diplomats to work out. It shouldn't in any way preclude or dictate a solution uh, to this intractable conflict. But it has to be begun, the negotiations, the discussions, the honest discussions have to begin from a, a correct analysis, a correct application of international law, and an honest, equal application of the rules to the Jewish state as well as to all the others.
Thank you so much.